Well, let me invite you to turn with me uh, to the sixth chapter of Ephesians. This is our last um, uh, moment in this chapter in Ephesians, because obviously we have missions conference the next two weeks, and then uh, Family Sunday, and we're into the Lenten season, and that'll get us focused on celebrating the passion of our Lord and getting kind of in that spirit of uh, ready to walk through Holy Week and Easter and so forth that's coming up. So anyway, we're going to wrap up our series today uh, that we've been looking at the second half of the book of Ephesians, uh, where we've been kind of grappling and wrestling with the implications of the first half. This is that we call it the, the do walk, love walk kind of part where we're, we're, what does it look like to put that stuff we talked about into practice? And today, uh, Paul is going to use a, a, a passage that's just sort of rife with, with imagery and metaphor and, and uh, kind of symbolism um, that, that deserves a whole series in and of itself. We don't, we don't have time to go there. But at any rate, we're going we're to touch on it a little bit this morning. So follow along with me as we read these final words from Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert. With all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you may know that you may also know uh, how I'm doing and what I'm doing. Tychicus, my beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to you, to the brothers and sisters, love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love that is incorruptible. And that, my friends, all of it is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the way that which, in which you, by your Holy Spirit, inspired and directed and motivated and, and in, in, imbued with your creative spark, the Apostle Paul, to pen these words to his friends in Ephesus. And even though his words were directed to a particular group of people and place and time, yet they ring true in our day by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, God, we ask right now that your Holy Spirit would come afresh in this moment, to quicken our hearts and and deepen our understanding so that in hearing your word, we might also obey. Because we want to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know how in tune you are with current events or how much uh, or where you get your news from, but there's been quite a buzz over the last 10 or so days about what's happening in Wilmore, Kentucky. Uh, there is a, a move of God's Spirit on the campus of Asbury University that's being called the Asbury Revival. Uh, and it is not, it's, it's one uh, among a series of, of events similar that have taken place on that campus and in other parts of the country as well, in other parts of the world as well. But in this particular moment, The eyes of the world, in fact, many people from the world are all focused on, and some are even coming to little Wilmore, Kentucky, to see what's going on. And uh, and so much so that I read a letter from the president this morning, they're going to have to kind of adjust some of their logistics and how they're doing things because they just, it's just so disruptive. And so, because news crews and people, they're they're just flocking in uh, to this little campus. It all started with a chapel service, just a normal, routine, everyday kind of chapel service in which the speaker 
uh, just shared a message from his heart. It wasn't anything that, that you, if you just looked at it on the surface, you would say that was the, the, the thing that made it happen. It was the fact that God decided to show up at that moment in a particular way to touch the hearts and lives of those students and the faculty there. And they've been meeting for prayer and intercession and, and communion with God and with fellowship with one another, and they've been giving testimony uh, about the, the, the effect that this is having on them both personally, individually, and on many of their relationships. It, they're giving testimony of the way God's healed some relationships, has helped them, they, them pursue forgiveness and or reconciliation and restitution in some cases. Uh, if you haven't, I don't, if you haven't been clued into this the last 10 days, I would encourage you to just kind of get out there and find out a little bit more, but it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, and there's a lot being written about it, I will tell you that much. All over the map, people have opinions, right? And they're going to tell you what they think about this. Some pro, some con, some, some enthusiastic, some skeptical. It's just kind of all over the map. Uh, but the, the reality is, when, when, when revival or renewal or whatever you want to call it comes, when there's a move of God's Spirit that touches the hearts of God's people, when there is, there is a, there's sort of an outpouring of His Spirit, it has, it has a couple of effects, one of which is to draw us closer to God. It, it, it sort of has that, that, that sense of deepening our communion and our relationship with God and, and fueling and feeding the hunger that we all have spiritually at some level to be in a relationship with our Creator. But so often, a genuine revival and a genuine renewal, and this, is, this remains to be seen in terms of what's happening in Asbury, then has lots of ripple effects. And it has incredible social impact. When you read the history of the first and the second great awakening here in America, and you see what happened around similar times in Europe, it, you, you see that the, the, the social change and the impact of folks coming out of those, those moments, those mountaintop experiences, if you will, they came out of them, and then they, then they started to put their life back into service, as it were in very practical ways. Institutions, educational institutions were born, hospitals, mission agencies. In fact, I, I referenced, I think it was last year, that one of those kind of moments in history was what's known as the Haystack Prayer Moment that happened in England that gave birth to what we now know as the modern missions movement. That, did not, that hasn't existed forever, by the way. I don't know if you all <laughs> are aware of that. But it, it, what we now know as kind of global missions and the way it, it's shaped right now had its origins in a group of people who took shelter in a rainstorm under a haystack. And they started praying together. And God showed up in a powerful way. And out of that moment of deeper intimacy and communion with God grew this, this sort of world-changing transformation. And what you find is that when these movements of God's Spirit are genuine and authentic, it's more than just the personal mountaintop experience. It goes on to have wide-ranging impact because there is a connection, a powerful connection between our daily, sometimes ordinary and mundane lives and the move of God's Spirit in the unseen spiritual realm, which is every bit as real as what you and I see, feel, and touch. Nobody's going to say amen to that. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? It, though we can't see it, it doesn't mean it isn't real. And every once in a while, there are, there are glimpses that we get and just how when it sort of breaks in, and maybe you've had an experience in your own life where you've seen just a little glimpse of that spiritual realm kind of breaking into your everyday ordinary experience in profound ways. Well, that kind of connection, if you will, is exactly what underlies what Paul is writing in this latter part of chapter 6, this connection between the, the, the life that you and I live in the material world, if you will, and, and the very real spiritual realm in which we live. And, and how those things kind of merge together and impact each other. And that's where he's going in this last little section uh, of this, this chapter. It's, it's, uh, when, I, when I read it in preparation for this Sunday, I, I was just really struck by, it seems like an odd juxtaposition. Like, remember he's been talking about these, these household relationships, husbands and wives, parent, child, slave, master, the things we've been wrestling with the last three weeks. And then he sort of pulls the focal length of his lens back to get a wide view angle, as if to say, look, that stuff we just talked about, it ain't easy. You cannot submit yourself 
to one another out of reverence for Christ in your own power, in your own strength. You, cannot, you don't have enough in you to pull that off. You need a power greater than what you bring to the equation. You need, a, you need a power source that you can tap into that can give you the grace, that can give you the strength, that can give you the compassion and the understanding and the servant-hearted that in your sinful, broken self, you do not possess. You need the Holy Spirit. And that's where he goes in this next little section. Look at verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood... It's not just the material world, but we're, we're dealing with a spiritual world against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You cannot do it on your own. There is a, there is a, 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 a spiritual realm that is very real. And we don't need to be uh, hypersensitive or, or you know, looking for you know, a demon behind every bush kind of thing, but the reality is we live in a world in which the material, practical, mundane, ordinary life that you and I lead every day that involves going to the grocery store and paying bills and all that kind of stuff, and the spiritual realm where angels and saints go before us and the majesty of God is on full display, those things are equally real. And sometimes they come together. And Paul wants us to understand there's no way we can live the life that we're called to in Christ in our own power. We need help. Not only that, but we can't affect change in our world. We can't affect uh, change in our community. We can't usher in the glory of God's kingdom. We can't bring his shalom to Centerville and beyond in our own strength. No matter how good our ideas are, no matter how creative or innovative our programs might be, all of that in and of itself cannot bring a greater measure of God's kingdom to our community. There's only one who can do that. And it's the Holy Spirit of God when he chooses and how he chooses. And that's what Paul, I think, is trying to get us to understand. We're, we're not going to be able to do battle against the corrupt systems of this world where we see injustice to right it, to speak out, to speak up, to show up, like we talked about a couple weeks ago. You can't do that in your own strength. Well, maybe once or twice, but it's not sustainable. And furthermore, the impact that you're going to have is going to be so limited because you're operating out of your own strength. But we tap into that power. We have what it takes, not in and of ourselves, but because we are brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the Most High God who have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who empowers us. And he uses this imagery uh, of the, the uh, sort of battlement, if you will, the armor of God. Uh, remember, he's writing this uh, letter from, from what context? Anybody remember? A jail cell, right? And so as he sits in this jail cell, undoubtedly there must have been one or two uh, Roman guards, corrections officers, within eyesight of him, probably who were wearing some of this, this armor, right? And my guess is, as he's jotting down this, these final thoughts in the letter to his friends in Ephesus, he's kind of looking up and going, okay, we got a helmet, we got a breastplate, we got a, you know, and, and, and trying to draw the, the connections on a, on a metaphorical sense, right? And as I said earlier, that, that whole thing deserves a, a series in and of itself. Each, each one of those pieces could, could take up a whole sermon uh, to develop a series on. But I want to focus on one in particular. One piece in particular that I think is not necessarily more important than the others, but it, it is vitally important, and that is what he refers to as the breastplate of righteousness. Because the breastplate is, is designed to protect what vital organ? Heart. Your heart, right? If you, get, if you take a spear or an arrow or a bullet to the heart, that's game over. And... And, and, and he, he focuses on that, and he calls it the breastplate of righteousness. And, and that, that sense of righteousness is not just what we typically think of as sort of moral purity, if you will. It includes that, but it's not solely that. It's this holistic sense of being fully who we are in Christ and acting that way. That who we say we are and how we live 
match up. There's integrity there. Uh, I love the way one author described it in terms of his, from a historical perspective. Uh, when he wrote about it, his name is um, James, uh, John DeFrancis. He, he wrote about it in his book called Reclaiming the High Ground of uh, the Ethical High Ground. Listen to what he says. During the time of the 12 Caesars, the Roman army would conduct morning inspections. As the inspecting centurion would come in front of each legionnaire, the soldier would strike his right fist on the armor of his breastplate that covered his heart, and the armor had to be strongest there in order to protect the heart from the sword thrusts and arrow strikes. And as the soldier struck his armor, he would shout out, Integritas! Which in Latin means material wholeness, completeness, and entirety. The inspecting centurion would then listen very carefully, not only for this affirmation, but for the ring that he needed to hear, that that armor was solid and sound. Satisfied that the armor was sound, that the soldier beneath it was protected, he would then move on to the next man. And about the same time, the Praetorians, or the imperial bodyguard, were ascending into power and influence. They were drawn from the best politically correct elite, well-heeled, well-connected of society. They received the finest equipment and armor. They no longer had to shout integritas to signify that their armor was sound. Instead, as they struck their breastplate, they would shout, Hail Caesar! to signify that their heart belonged to the imperial personage and not to their unit or institution or code of ideals. They armored themselves to serve the cause of a single man. A century passed, he writes, and the rift between the legion and the imperial bodyguard and its successes grew larger. To signify the difference between the two organizations, the legionnaire, upon striking his armor, would no longer shout integritas, but instead would shout integer. Integer means undiminished complete, perfect. It not only indicated that the armor was sound, but it also indicated that the soldier wearing the armor was of sound character. He was complete in his integrity in his heart. And he was in the right place in his standards and his morals were high. He was not associated with the immoral conduct that was rapidly becoming the signature of the Praetorian Guards. The armor of integrity continued to serve the legion well, he writes, for over, 400 centuries, for over four centuries they held the line against the marauding Gauls and Vandals. But by 383 AD, the social decline that infected the Republic and the Praetorian Guard had its effects upon the legion. As a fourth century Roman general wrote, when because of negligence and laziness parade ground drills were abandoned, the customary armor began to feel heavy since the soldiers rarely, if ever, wore it. Therefore, they first asked the emperor to set aside the breastplates and the mail and then the helmets. And so our soldiers fought the Goths without any protection for their heart and head and were often beaten by archers. Although there were many disasters which led to the loss of great cities, no one tried to restore the armor to the infantry. They took their armor off, and when the armor came off, so too came their integrity. It was only a matter of a few years until the legion rotted from within and was unable to hold the frontiers for the barbarians were at the gates. Proverbs 4.23 says to you and me, guard your heart, for from it is the wellspring of life. It's who you are who you say you are and how you live, is there integrity there? And if there isn't, it's usually a heart issue. There's something amiss with your heart. And sometimes we need to, to, to acknowledge that we haven't maybe worn the breastplate of righteousness, that we've taken our armor off and allowed our heart to be compromised or led astray. And Paul says it's vitally important that you guard your hearts, that you keep that breastplate of righteousness in, intact by God's grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We need his help. And he promises. And Paul says there's a way to get access to that help. It's the, it's the secret weapon in this list, though he doesn't call it part of the armor. <laughs> 
It's kind of, it kind of reminds me of the, 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 the scenes you know, in the James Bond movies where he goes down to the research lab and he gets the secret weapons that he's going to need for that mission, right? This is, this is, the, this is the, the, the secret weapon that's not listed in the list of armaments. Look at verse 18. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. You see, gang, prayer is one of the many forms that our devoted life takes. It's not the only form, but it is one of them. And it's a vitally important one of them. And every time you see a movement like you're seeing in Asbury right now, like you've seen in, in other times in history, every time those movements of God's Spirit in profound and historical ways have been birthed in prayer. Anybody remember the day of Pentecost? What happened then? One of the great moments in history, right? 3,000 people come to Christ in one day. It's crazy. They're speaking in other languages they haven't studied. It's wild, right? How did that all start? Where were they when that broke out? Praying together. Waiting for the, the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus told them, you got you to wait. You, you can't do this on your own. He had already told them, you're going to do greater things. You're going to go farther, and, and your reach is going to be greater than, than I can accomplish as a single person, right? But, but you got to wait until the Holy Spirit comes. He's the one that can make it possible. And they were praying. And amazing things happened. And, and you see this pattern over and over and over again. And you and I are encouraged to be people who tap into the spiritual realm through the mystery and the wonder of prayer. In fact, God's word admonishes us and exhorts us to pray, for example, for those who are in authority. 1 Timothy 2, uh, 1 to 4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayer, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet and godly, dignified life in every way. This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. God's word encourages us to pray for the welfare of our city. In Jeremiah 29, he speaks to the people in exile who didn't want to be there, who their living conditions were not ideal by any stretch of the imagination. And yet God speaks through the prophet and he says to them, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And in fact, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are, we, are, we are sort of tapping into that and entering into that. When we say, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. We don't use hallowed very much in our common you know, conversations, do we? But it essentially it means to make holy. Lord, let your name be respected and revered and worshipped throughout the whole earth. Let your kingdom come here, now, through me, through us, in the living of our daily lives. Let your will be done on earth, in my life, in, in, in my family's life, in our church's life, in this community, in our city, in our state, in our nation, in the world. Let your will be done just as it is in heaven. And we're tapping into that power source. So, here's where it's going to get interesting. I know the introverts in the room are very uncomfortable right now and they're going to get more uncomfortable. So just take a breath. It's going to be okay. The extroverts are like, yeah, what? What are we doing? Right? Everybody, just take a breath. We're, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to, to, to scooch down the seats and meet up with a couple of folks and pray. Circle up, group up. 
And if you're an introvert and you're not comfortable talking or praying out loud, that's fine. Don't. Just pray quietly. If you're an extrovert and you're looking at them like, why aren't you praying? Stop it, right? <laughs> just, just give everybody some space to be who they are, right? And if you're new here, if you're a guest, a first-time guest, and you're like, this people, these people are really weird. We're going to do this touchy-feely thing. It's okay. You don't, ha- you don't have to do anything that you know, really gets way out of your comfort zone. But I, I just want to ask us now to take a- just a couple minutes, and would you pray together in groups, three, four, five, and, and don't, don't pray like six minutes worth of prayer. Just keep it short and to the point. For our church, for our community, for our nation, for the world, for our mission partners, let's intercede and ask God, his Holy Spirit, to use us in profound ways in our day and time. We don't have to go to Wilmore, Kentucky to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You can, but you don't have to, because he's here, and he's waiting on us to come and talk to him and ask him. So would you take just a couple minutes, and then I'll close. Don't worry. You're like, when is this going to end? I'll close this in a, in a couple minutes in prayer, but would you, just, would you just gather up with some folks? And again, just if you're not comfortable praying out loud, that's okay. Um, and if you're sitting next to somebody you don't know, uh, at least say hello. At least introduce yourself at the very least, right? So just take a moment and let's pray. And for those of you who are watching online, let me just encourage you right now, as these folks are gathering in groups, if you're sitting uh, with anyone else to take a few moments in your living room around your kitchen table and and gather together and and pray as we are. Uh, If you're not with someone and you're just watching on your own, that's okay too, but but take a moment in the quietness of your own space and, and just join us if you would in praying together. So let's be in prayer for a few moments, okay?